Hi, my name is Dr. David Peterson. I'm an assistant professor of kinesiology at Cedarville University in Cedarville, Ohio. What I would like to talk to you today about is a study we did at the United States Naval Academy to assess the impact of anthropometric measures such as height, tibia length, humerus length, torso length, and gender on max sit-up performance. The abstract for the study read as follows. The U.S. Navy currently employs sit-ups as part of its semi-annual physical fitness test to assess the core muscular endurance of its service members. However, there is speculation that sit-up performance may be due, at least in part, to anthropometric proportions, thereby affording certain service members with a biomechanical advantage, independent of their level of physical fitness. If proven true, this would present a compelling argument against the notion that sit-ups are a fair and impartial field test. To test this theory, anthropometric measurements were taken at various sites across a sample size of 69 participants, 37 male, 32 female, from the United States Naval Academy. Humerus length, tibia length, and gender were all found to be positively correlated with sit-up performance. These findings, coupled with well-documented concerns of the sit-ups in the literature, make a compelling argument for the identification of other potential field tests to assess core muscular endurance. In roughly 1987, the U.S. Navy introduced the sit-ups in order to evaluate core muscular endurance. The sit-ups were added, at least in part, due to research at the time suggesting that sit-up training could help prevent low back pain. However, since the implementation, the safety and operational relevance of the sit-up has been called into question. For example, current research shows that high volume sit-up training actually causes or promotes low back pain instead of preventing it. Additionally, the sit-ups have been shown to have very limited to no operational relevance. For example, rarely do service members perform repetitive spinal flexion as a specific job task. Instead, they stabilize their core in order to lift, pull, push, and carry. Another concern with the sit-up is the possibility for an unfair biomechanical advantage. It has long been thought that sit-ups are easier to perform for some service members than others. Additionally, the range of motion required in order to complete the sit-up is sometimes vastly different between service members. For example, some service members, for myself for example, have to bring their low back all the way off the floor in order for their elbows to make contact with their middle thighs. Other service members can actually touch their elbows to their upper thighs with significantly less range of motion, in some cases, keeping their low back in contact with the ground the entire time. Again, the concern is that sit-ups is relatively easy to perform for some service members, whereas more relatively difficult for others. Additionally, the range of motion required in order for the elbows to make contact with the upper thighs seems to differ significantly in often cases between one service member to another. The purpose of this study was to evaluate the impact of limb and torso length on sit-up performance. The authors hypothesized that individuals with longer limbs may have a certain biomechanical advantage and therefore have higher maximum sit-up performance. Table one in the study depicts the demographics of the test subjects. As you can see, 37 were male, 32 were female. We also wanted to see if maybe ethnicity 
would play a part in terms of sit-up performance. It turns out that ethnicity played a very minor to neg negligible role. There was 49 Caucasians that participated, eight Asians, two Hispanic, six multi-race, and then there were four individuals that opted not to provide their ethnicity. It also, table one provides the mean of the age, the height, weight, the humerus in centimeters, the torso in centimeters, femur, tibia also in centimeters, as well as the number of sit-ups. So you can see that the mean age was roughly 25 plus or minus 10 years. The height was about five foot seven, five foot eight, plus or minus three and a half to 3.6 inches. The weight, 161 plus or minus 26 pounds. And the number of sit-ups was roughly 97 plus or minus 24. The next slide will actually show where the different measurements were taken in terms of for the humerus, the torso, the femur, and the tibia. For the torso, the measurement was taken at the spinal process of C7 to the midline of the iliac crest. For the humerus, the measurement was taken at the top of the acromion process to the lateral epicondyle. For the femur, measurement was taken at the greater trochanter to the lateral epicondyle. And finally, measurement for the tibia was taken at the medial condyle to the medial malleolus. In terms of methods, the official procedures were taken from the Navy Physical Readiness Test manuscript and read verbatim. The sit-up test ended at the end of two minutes or sooner if the participant voluntarily stopped, lowered one or both of their legs, lifted their feet or their buttocks off the floor, failed to keep arms folded and touching the upper chest, or if they lowered one or both arms. The results of the study are displayed here in tables two, three, and four. Table two shows the correlation between certain limb measurements and sit-up performance. You can see the correlation between the humerus and sit-up performance at a correlation coefficient of 0.297. The torso had a lesser correlation of 1.91. The femur had the lowest at 0 0.088, and the tibia had the greatest at 0.2. Three, five. What we see with table three is also interesting. This shows the impact of certain limb measurements on sit-up performance. For example, the average number of sit-ups for individuals that had greater than or less than 38 centimeters in the humerus, their average number of sit-ups was roughly 105. Whereas individuals that had less than or equal to 37.9 centimeters in terms of their humerus measurement, only had 89.5 sit-ups. Similarly, individuals who had a tibia length greater than or equal to 41 centimeters had a sit-up performance on average of 106, whereas individuals who had less than or equal to 40.9 centimeters in tibia length their average number of sit-ups was 86. Table four also shows that there was a difference in terms of gender and sit-up performance as well, i.e. the average number of sit-ups for the male participants was 104, whereas the average or the mean for females was 89. So overall, the results showed a modest positive correlation between tibia, humerus, length, 
height and sit-up performance. And it's believed that the correlation between sit-up performance and height was the inclusion of the tibia length in overall assessment of height, simply because there was such a limited impact in femur, again, with a correlation coefficient of only 0 0.088. The results showed, on average, that longer-limbed participants performed more sit-ups than shorter-limbed participants. Again, that was displayed in chap uh, Table 3 in the previous slide. The results also showed a significant difference in humerus and tibia length between males and females. Again, the last slide showed us that there was a difference of roughly 15 sit-ups on average between what the male participants completed compared to what the female participants completed. And this is important because currently at the Naval Academy and in the US Navy, the number of sit-ups required to get a particular classification, for example, outstanding, excellent, good, satisfactory, or failure, is the same for both males and females within the same age category. This study would suggest or maybe recommend that there be differences in those sit-up requirements within the same age, age category for male participants and females because of the differences that gender and height has on sit-up performance. Discussion. To kind of test our theory, we selected two participants. I was subject A, and one of my fellow officers was subject B. I am five foot seven. My fellow officer was six foot three. He can easily perform 100 sit ups within two minutes, and I struggled to get about 65 or 67. So we compared his anthropometric measurements to mine to see if. Maybe there was some type of a visual, visual depiction in terms of the level of difficulty and the amount of distance required in order for my elbows to touch my upper thighs compared to his elbows touching his upper thighs. So you can see for subject A, again, which was me, whenever we entered in all of my uh, demographics into Adobe Illustrator, you can see that my distance between my elbows and upper thighs, which is depicted as the letter E in this particular graphic, is greater than the distance required for subject B, my fellow officer, based off of his uh, demographics and his anthropometric measurements. So again, there does appear to be some validity to the hypothesis that different anthropometric measures can impact not only the level of difficulty, but also the distance that the individual has to travel in order for their elbows to make contact with their upper thighs. Authors believe that the results of this study have both good internal and external validity. And this is based on the fact that all participants were either active duty, recently retired from active duty, or students in a military service academy. That means that all participants were very well versed and had an extensive amount of practice and participation in the sit-up test. One limitation of the study, however worth noting, is the lack of standardization between the distance between the heels and the buttocks. Although it was read verbatim from the instructions taken from the Navy PRT or physical readiness test manual in terms of where the feet placement should be, individuals were allowed to manipulate foot placement slightly based off of how they take the sit-up test for scoring purposes for real. I.e., each of these individuals have to take the sit-up test at least twice a year and that sit-up test, whatever their setup is in terms of feet placement, we allowed them to use for this test because we didn't want them to do something vastly different than what they've done before or plan on doing 
again in the future. That means some individuals were probably inside that 10 to 12 inches from heels to buttocks. That also means that some individuals were probably more than 12 inches away from heels to buttocks. In some individuals during the test, that distance got greater. In some individuals during the execution of the test, that distance may have gotten smaller. So a recommendation for future studies is that you standardize and maintain that distance of 10 to 12 inches from the heels to the buttocks, just to make sure that that distance itself didn't play a significant role in the overall number of sit-ups the participant could perform. Some of the conclusions that we could take away from this particular study. Although the authors hypothesized that all anthropometric measurements would significantly correlate with sit-up performance, i.e. torso and femur, the results showed that only tibia and humerus length were modestly correlated. The results also showed that gender was moderately correlated with sit-up performance as well. And we said that was important because currently the standards that we use in terms of the number of sit-ups required to receive a particular rating is the same for both genders within a particular age category. Application in sport. So what do we do with this information now that we know it? The results suggest that in addition to age, performance standards for sit-ups should be adjusted for both height and gender. An important update, in August 2019, Navy leadership, as a result of this study, and as well as other studies and numerous uh, releases in the literature, have decided to go away from the sit-ups and instead go to the standard front plank. They are currently in the beta test phase of this particular study, which means it'll probably take several years before they come up with uh, proposed norms and have tested a large enough uh, number of active duty sailors to get the data required to develop official performance standards. I would also like to thank several individuals for their contributions to this study. First and foremost, Lieutenant Megan Middleton, the fourth company officer at the United States Naval Academy. She did a significant amount of work on this particular project to include most of the data collection. Would also like to recognize uh, Mr. Dan Reiner from the United States Naval Academy for his involvement in the initial um, statistical analysis and then there were several midshipmen that helped with data collection as well, and their names are listed. I would also like to thank several individuals from Cedarville, from Cedarville University for their contributions. First and foremost, Dr. Sharon Chrisman. She did the final data analysis and statistical analysis for us, as well as uh, Christy Coe, who's an assistant professor of nursing here at Cedarville who helped out significantly with the initial literature review. And then we had several individuals from Cedarville University Center for Teaching and Learning, Jared Piles, and a few students that helped with some of the graphics in terms of the figures used for this study. The next two slides depict the literature review that we conducted and provides all of the information for the different articles that we used in this particular study.